I'm Beth Hyland, and I'm with Clyde Rathman. And it's May 25th, 2012, at the Radisson in Corning, New York. And it's Glassfest, and Mr. Rathman has joined me to talk about his career at Corning. And so welcome. Thank you. Thank and you. And so, uh, again, would you tell me your name? Okay, my name is Clyde Rathman, and uh, I live in South Corning today. I've, I came to Corning in 1950, and it was my first job out of school. And uh, I often heard people tell me that you never stay in your first job because you just don't do things like that. But I never found a good reason to, to quit, and I've enjoyed the whole time here in Corning and in the, for Corning Incorporated. So, uh, what would you like to hear? Tell me the kinds of jobs you were doing. Well, okay. Uh, I had I had a, a specific job, in this case in 1957, after I had been with the company seven years, I was located in Main Plant, and uh, I, I, an astrophysicist came to town. His name was Dr. Aidan Minnell. And Dr. Minnell was located in uh, Arizona and involved in astronomy. And he looked at the 200-inch mirror that was on display in the glass center, and he said, you know, I'd like one of those, but I don't want one quite that big. I'd like, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to have you Corning make one, and uh, uh, and I'll put it in Arizona in, as a solar telescope. Cool. And so we went on to say to say a little more, uh, but uh, to back up, the the famous 200-inch mirror was of course on display in the class center, and it had been on display in the in the Centerway Square many years before that, and. Uh, when he would like one in 1957, we realized we hadn't made a mirror like that in, since 1932. And uh, I happened to get the job of, uh, you do it. And I didn't know beans about telescopes or anything, of, not much about that, that type of uh, activity. But uh, uh, we had an order and uh, we committed to deliver one. And uh, so then we, I, I was putting, I put together a, a team that would make it. And in doing that, we found records from 1932 and it's found as many as we could to say, well, what was done before? And that was a real archival uh, search. But uh, in doing that search, we realized that there was the person who had, was involved in the mirror was still living and in Corning and that was Dr. McCauley. And uh, so I called upon him and asked him if he'd be interested in consulting on this job. And he agreed he would. And that was uh, comforting in my mind. At least we had some really, some person who was there and he, it was there and did that and did it. So we went over, he went over the records and we had and the problems that might have occurred at that time to some detail. And uh, things moved along. And then uh, I had some questions. And so he came down one day and I asked these questions and he looked at me and stopped and he said, I'm not gonna give you an answer. He said, my boss was Dr. So-and-so, I'd forgotten his name, and he said, uh, he was very uh, much involved, and he wouldn't let me do anything or make any decisions whatsoever. And he said, I'm not going to take that role. You have a good head on your shoulders, and you decide, and you'll be all right. So clunk. That, that wasn't too uh, enlightening. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's the way it started. Uh, this telescope, mirror, this telescope that was going to be built was but he installed in a hole in the ground in Kitt Peak in Arizona. And they probably drilled a hole 
eight or 10 feet in diameter and maybe 50, 60 feet deep. And they put this mirror in the bottom of the hole. And of course they wanted us to study the sun and they're in a fixed location on the earth down in this deep hole. And how is it gonna ever see the sun? So they put a, a, a flat mirror above ground that would intercept the sun's rays and shine it down into the hole. Wow. And uh, that was kind of interesting. So, uh, what else? This mirror was a, a, this mirror was part of a reflecting telescope. It, it isn't like a telescope that you look, look through, it, but it, the mirror collects the lights and it's called a reflecting telescope. Uh, Hmm. I'm off the track here. That's not helpful. Uh, one of the points I wanted to make was when I'd asked Dr. McCauley for advice on this detail and that detail, and, and uh, he came back with the answer that his boss wouldn't let him make any decisions, and therefore I won't uh, comment on your, your list, but uh, use your own head and you'll be all right. So. At that time, it was not what I wanted to hear, but it was a good lesson. When you're the responsible party, you cannot pass the buck. And do your best. And if you did your homework, you, you'll likely be all right. That is a good and lesson. I, that, that holds true all through my work uh, experience here in Corning. We built a mold, selected big boulders of glass, put them in the mold, on top of the mold, and built an oven over, the, over that and reheated these boulders carefully to slump them into a mold cavity and uh, that formed the desire mirror blank. Back in 1932, there, the first attempt was a failure. There were problems where parts of the mold came loose and uh, floated up into the, into, the, into the glass itself. So anyway, we were aware of all this and that and when we assembled this thing and slumped it, we moved it into a, after red hot, into a, an annealing oven and uh, began to cool it down. We had to cool it one sixth of a degree per day through the critical ranges. And uh, it takes a long time to cool down when you're going one sixth of a, one -sixth of a degree. But uh, it was a great experience and uh, it was fun to be part of that. And that led really to my involvement in one mirror after a mirror, a whole series of mirrors were built back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it was a lot of fun. But we never, we never, rep I don't think we ever really uh, made another one with the, the glass, the same glass that was used in 32 and in, in 1957. Uh, it was that was silicate or? It was a very diff difficult, stiff glass, because very low expansion. Uh, the furnaces that melted the glass uh, were filled with batch materials and it simmered at uh, the highest temperature you could possibly get. And, uh, and then you turn the fires off and let it cool down full. So you had this huge bathtub of glass that was two and three feet deep, and you could pry boulders out of that uh, to use them to reheat and slump them. You could, but uh, extremely stiff. So that, that's my story. That's great. Uh, you said you had a connection with the glass center with this story too? Well, first Ben. when I first came to Corning, uh, I joined a group and it had a lot of new employees. And uh, not being married, they said, well, then you're available to an, uh, an assignment. And they, my first assignment was, was to go to Wellsboro and uh, learn something about the glass industry there. So I, I, I moved down to Wellsboro and, and I spent six months there just learning what was going on until I finally called back and said, I've seen enough and talked enough and what have you. Let's get on with it. I want a job. I don't want to just be investigating all the time. 
So he said, okay, then come on back here. And uh, the first uh, assignment was the glass center. It was under construction. Wow. And uh, inside they were, the management, that's another, this is the, the next story really. Uh, I was told that they're going to build a glass factory inside the museum. And uh, I should get familiar with it because uh, I could be involved. I, they needed somebody to be involved in, in, the, uh, in that operation. But I, I'll be, but we're better off when I get prepared for another talk on that one. Okay. If, if you don't mind. That's fine. Because that, uh, that's only the first chapter. Uh -huh. uh, the Glass Center was conceived as a 100th anniversary gift to the city to build a, you might say, a, something of interest to, to tourism. That's right. And uh, Stuben Glass was uh, always, was just a small part of the main plant and they had uh, craftsmen that would fashion the glass, but all the glass that was ever melted for Stuben was, was served to them on a platter, so, so to speak. In this case, now they had their own factory and they were on their own and they had to do the job by themselves. And uh, uh, off the record, I think the Stuben people said, or who, I'm, I'm not sure who was in charge or who was involved, but uh, the Fulhouten family had uh, members that were interested in the Metropolitan Museum of, uh, of what? Uh, of art. Of art. uh, of arts. Mm -hmm. And music and that, 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 that general area. And Crystal was, again, a, an art object that was something they, they wanted to support. And so uh, I might guess that being a brand new employee there, someone had decided that, well, we'll, we'll make this, this glass and have it on display and uh, it doesn't matter what the cost is, it's for prestige. And uh, so the engineering group gave them the state-of-the-art furnace, which would give them the crystal they wanted, but it was too big. And, uh, and when you put a factory in a museum, you've got pollution to involve, you've got lead vapors, you've got uh, a number of hazardous things that I don't think people really thought of. If they did think about it, they just dismissed it and said, we're going to do it anyway. Sure. So I was deeply in, well, I, I became it. it was like, like the mirror project. Here's a project we need somebody to, to, to guide it through to su a success and stay on top of it. And so that was my first job there. And I spent about a year, year and a half. They said, do you want a permanent job here? And I said, no, I don't want to specialize in some fancy crystal. It's beautiful, great, but uh, uh, it ran day and night, and they only had the museum open during the day. So two-thirds of, of the time, it was idle. Oh, really? Pouring glass down, and you didn't use it, and that's not very efficient. No. So we made a took all this fine raw materials and what have you and put it in the glass. And he said, well, you can't use it over again. Well, yes, you can. So we ended up putting 75, 80% of the glass back in as, as, as ground color. As color, okay. Uh, he said, well, it'll ruin the crystal and it, it didn't really do it. But even then, you had the cost of the furnace and fuel and all of that material going on day and night and you're not using it. It's costly. Yeah. Uh, 
Then on top of it, uh, wine glasses and goblets and what have you were used for drinking. And it's a heavy lead glass, and it's a hazard to health because the, the minor, minuscule amounts of lead would come off the glass and go in your, in your system. So uh, at that point, it was no longer fashionable to use lead glass crystal for drinking wine. That's true. And uh, Corning then switched to a barium glass. People didn't like to use it, so they imported it from Germany. Okay. Uh, so we weren't making a soup, and the Germans were. Yeah. But uh, you know, one thing led to another, to another, that sort of thing, and finally a decision, of course, shut the factory down, tear it all out, and enough is enough. After 50 years. Uh, but that story is just one, one chapter of uh, what ties in, and I'm not sure how to, how to present this, and maybe it's, Corny doesn't want to hear it or put it on paper anyway, but this is one man's opinion. That's what we're asking that, for. <laughs> and it might be interesting to uh, put it together in a, in, in rehearsed basis. But uh, uh, what was needed back in 1950 was a source of glass in small quantities, in high quality, at low cost. Well, we didn't find it. It wasn't at low cost. It's the solution that was applied to the glass center was not low cost. Absolutely, you're right. So they said, no matter, that's, if that's what we did, we'll go ahead, do it anyway, because uh, television was paying the bills for the most part. And, uh, uh, but there was, beyond the glass center, there was a need for high quality glass in small quantities, and we didn't know how to do that. Well, uh, it wasn't, in World War II, binoculars might have been a, a wartime item in, in wartime. We couldn't make them in this country because there wasn't a good source of, of optical glass available. And a crew went into, uh, well, many of the people that were at Stupin went to West Virginia and they started a facility down there to make optical glass from binoculars, and they failed. Oh, really? We didn't have a, we didn't have a process. Till after the war, there was finally the process developed, and they started producing night glasses, which is uh, a high quality glass of the right index of refraction, what have you, and. and and we served that market very well for quite a number of years. That was down in the Harrodsburg, Kentucky? In, yeah, in 40, well, in the main plant. Main plant before then. Because it, it, the Harrodsburg wasn't built until 1952. That's true. This was after the glass center. Okay. And, and the optical glass facilities uh, were in main plant, but the cost, uh, The facility used platinum, a lot of it, yeah. and, and Dick and I knew only, well, only too well what was in, in involved in, in running that furnace. And, uh, very dependent on, on uh, the high cost of uh, that, that high cost material, but it would uh, slowly. Oh, it wasn't chosen for the glass center because it would have a slight yellow tinge. If you melted that glass in, in big chunks, you'd, you'd get, it wouldn't be as, as pristine and white, water white crystal. Oh, interesting. Okay. And technically, it was worse if there was any rhodium present in the, as, a, as a contaminant in the platinum. Platinum and rhodium are, are cousins in the, in the periodic table. Okay. We didn't discover until later that the rhodium was the, the culprit. 
So we really didn't, didn't have a s source of high quality glass at, in small quantities. There were a few stumbling blocks. And it was too early for any, there, those, those stumbling blocks were present when, when the glass center was to be built. So they didn't use that, for, that process. Uh, so. Uh, now was it Sullivan Park that finally solved those problems? No. No? That was? I, I recall there was uh, a Dr. Green who had a, a couple of people. One was Steve Albertelli. I don't know if you know Steve. Yeah. And uh, then there was uh, L. Irig, I H R I G. He, he wor they worked for Doc Green, another fellow named. Mm. The third person, they were charged with find a, you know, find an answer to this problem, and they never found it. And I got deeply involved in main plan. And uh, we put a uh, an optical glass tank there online, and uh, made nose cone for guided missiles with a. Oh, I think it was George Beale developed pyroceram about that time, which was a lithium aluminum silicate, and uh, it had distinct properties that were different than the other glasses. Uh, it cr would crystallize real quick, and it would get very fluid as you heat it up very fast. So one minute it's solid, the next thing it's, it's like, like melting wax on, on a candle. You know, it'd go from solid to liquid very quickly. Absolutely. Uh, and all those properties had to be taken into consideration when you tried to make something. But uh, uh, that furnace went in and it was successful. Oh, it needed nose cone missiles missile missile the cone the nose nose of a guided missile uh, that spiral ceram would allow it to go four thousand miles an hour and if you use any other material it would melt going that fast that the front end of those missiles would would just soften and droop and and uh, fail because you had a radar set inside and it had this it, it had to stand up, and it had the shape. You, you couldn't. It couldn't deform in flight. That ruined the. That ruined the radar's wow. signal. So, uh, that was. Oh, and some of those blanks weighed, weighed forty pounds a piece. Huge. Uh, huge items. That was a source of glass. You could buy. You could. You could make a 40-pound item with a small furnace and high quality and all the other properties of, of pyroceramics. We solved that problem almost by accident because some, oh, because the Navy wanted that stuff and they were, and they were, didn't, they didn't care what the cost was. Sure. So uh, the guys went together and they, they made a system where you uh, you put the glass in this into a like a small garbage can huh. until it was full, okay. and when it was full, you got enough to make a piece. So that death probe would uh, would realize that the, the tub was getting full. The alarm signal goes up. Everybody would jump to it. Let's go. We got to make one, and then pull up a, a plunger, and there would be a very fine stream of glass running out of the, this, this container while it was filling. Once it was full, now they could swing over, put a mold under, and what have you, lift the, like the plug in a sink, and zingo, 
40 pounds goes down in a mold, spin it up, and you've, you've made one. So it would spin. Right, centrifugal centrifugal centrifugally casting. Wow. We had made television funnels in the 50s. So by 57 and 59, we knew how to make spun items out of that glass. We knew how to store 40 pounds of hot glass and dump it instantaneously in a mold and, and uh, you know, had scissors would cut this thing uh, and they're very sloppy and fluid and the guys fussed around with taking movies of what's going on at, uh, what's the term? Not slow motion. But you'd, you'd speed up a camera taking maybe a thousand feet of film zip and then you could run it back at a slow rate and see what's going on that it would just happen in a flash when you're pouring so you could establish uh, controls you didn't want some you didn't want that that gob to be dribbling out in pieces or whatever it had to be a, a slug with a, a smooth face and a foot the front end and tail end had to be discreet. So they could analyze but those pictures. In the 50s, that was the first attempt, or first real, if you come back and say, how do you get high quality glass in small quantities at re reasonable price? That was the solution. It wasn't solved by asking that question. It was solved when the Navy says, I got to have such and such. And that produced it the setup that also was equivalent. And that was the end, and we forgot all about it then. And that, that process went on for years until the Navy didn't want them anymore. But uh, then I got involved. I think Dick was down in, in you were in Harrodsburg for, not from 52. No, about 58 or nine. 58? Came back in 71. Okay. Right. I was involved at Telescope in 57. He was there in Kentucky, 59. Anyway, uh, the optical glass business grew for eyeglasses. And photochromic glass came in. And I, I came out of, uh, I came out of a plant, the main plant, mm -hmm. and got involved in photochromic right away. I don't think they, the years will get sticky, but then I, when, when there was a decision to make photochromic lenses, sales says, we don't like it, it won't sell. And R&D said, this is the best we can do. And uh, the plant came back and says, now you want us to make these, turn these things darker and light like sun, you know, be an active thing. They weren't too sure they wanted to take it on. And three of us went to Kentucky and said, give us the tank and we'll run it. And we did for three months. And we divided the testing procedures and the limits and the specs and what have you. And Herod Berg says, why don't you guys go home? <laughs> that was success. We didn't force it on them, they asked for it. That's great. <laughs> and that's the way to do it, really. When you force a system, somebody goes away grumbling and saying, I don't like this and that, and it'll never work out, and all this and that, and, you can, and it won't work, <laughs> unless you take a positive attitude. So you spent three months working with them, solving the problems. Yeah. Three months in a motel in, in Harrodsburg. Well, we weren't, well, we were there, and we were running, and, and, and they'd watch and see what was going on. And, and then sales came by and said, hey, this is neat stuff we think. We switched it from pink to gray. Yeah. That was my contribution. I didn't, we were, they said we wanted a, a pink sunglass. And we were, one day we, were, we made gray ones by accident. And I took some blanks and had them ground in and made sunglasses out of them and I wore them and I said, Clyde, 
and some guy from uh, South America came to look and get a tour, and he said, I like that gray. I'll take 5,000 pounds as soon as you can send it to me. Ooh. And and the market just took off. Uh, that was fun. But uh, that was not really small quantity. It was high quality glass. And it was all this investment in platinum. And the, of course, people didn't like all that capital investment. In, in, and platinum materials. But it's great. It's great stuff. It works beautifully. So that developed, and we lost it. You know, plastic took over and says, "You don't want glass. It's heavy on your nose, and and uh, if you break it, it will cut your eyes." Man, that's ter terrible. But uh, then. What evolved was, uh, I don't know who it was, maybe Charlie DeVoe, but anyway, uh, somebody was talking with the Air Force and suggesting to the Air Force that we don't have a state, there isn't a facility in the United States that will make fine optical plies. And you had the Cuban crisis with the Russians putting missiles down on Cuba, and uh, the Air Force would whiz, fly over every half hour, for that matter, on, on some frequency, and would take pictures and keep and, and zip through. And uh, we knew what was going on because because of photo reconnaissance. If you wanted to find out if there's something going on, you send an airplane up with cameras and go flying over at 1,500 miles an hour, clicking off pictures. And the, the gliders that went up to 90,000 feet were flying over Russia, taking photographs until they shot one down. And I don't know whether it was, I don't know who was president at that time. He said, we won't put a, glider pilot in the air anymore because there was already a, the, the, the crash program to put a satellite in space. I got tagged with that job with Charlie DeVoe. That was 10 years, 10 years in process. Wow. But oh, because of that, trying to find out what's going on on the ground without being on the ground. Uh, that raised the question about why isn't there a stateside? We couldn't make binoculars in the 1940s. Now they want camera lenses, and these, camera lens, these cameras had were like 10 inch in diameter, huge wow. and heavy, and all kinds of glass. So we got a contract with the Air Force to manufacture optical glass and set up a whole facility. Huh. And that went to Virginia. Okay. And Virginia got the contract and they started, they had to melt 28 glasses and they weren't normal. Glasses had uh, lead borate, no sand in it at all, boric acid and lead. It's an interesting glass. Yeah. Uh, a tungsten glass, huh. uh, a lanthanum glass, a rare earth, uh, a heavy lead glass, and anyway, 28 of them. And they got all tangled up and they couldn't make the glass to specs, couldn't get the shapes. And they were three years behind. And I spent, there were three of us that went down to try to help, and we weren't helping. And it annoyed the plant. The visiting firemen come down. So to fix the problem, or what, we couldn't 
we were stuck with a contract. We had to fulfill it. The plant was unhappy. It was taking way too much time and effort on the part of everybody else. They couldn't do the rest of their job. Sure. So I moved to Virginia. And they said, good, there's 35 people. Uh, they're yours. If you've got a problem, don't come to us. It's your problem. Solve it. <laughs> so they gave me 35 guys, and I could work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. One, you needed one person. Yeah. So I, would, well, I got going on it, and uh, I talked to all 35 guys. Said, if you got a problem, you can call me. But don't call me at two o'clock in the morning unless you really have a problem. I can only do so much. And, and you're part of the team and a very important part. And it's, you know, if you don't know what's going on, ask. You, you're not sure if something, ask. And it worked out beautifully. We're back to what you told me in the beginning with encouraging people to figure out the problems, to get the information you need. Well, we, we needed all that. We needed all these people. And don't, don't pass the buck back to me, but I can, I can only do so much. Yeah. And we need, you know, do, do the best you can. And it, it, worked, out, it worked out well. Uh, you made your contract? Finished the contract. Made an inventory, started selling. We started bidding, bidding on, on lenses, fancy lenses, and uh, we had a marketing guy, and he would find out what was what the industry was needing, and uh, he'd bid on it, okay. and he wouldn't get a, any, he wouldn't get the order. The next time he had a chance, he took that same formula and cut it 10%. Bid again. Third time, bid again. I don't know how many times he did it, but not too much in one morning. If he went to a sales seminar or a optical glass and photo and seminar, and the sales manager for the German shot company came up to him and said, you know, what are you trying to do? You're ruining the market. <laughs> he had gotten an order. And it was the first one they didn't get. And he was upset. I bet. And that sales manager was named, I don't know, Reinhard Nimmerfroy. And Nimmer is never in German. And F-R-O-H, Freud, is happy. <laughs> that was the name of the sales manager. He was never happy. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got a bang out of that one. That's great. Well, we are out of time. Is there anything you wanted to say to conclude? No, I'll, I'll work on that one. Great. There's, there's, there's a re relationship of, of product line and furnaces and uh, the, the ultimate goal of high quality glass in small quantities at low prices. And uh, we're still fussing with that today. Yeah. But uh, there is, oh, we solved the, the, the optical glass business solved the question in Virginia. And I had a major part in that, and it was to get rid of the contract, and we did. And nobody said, oh, As soon as we finished the contract, we never got any more orders. And, and the whole inventory burned, was, was, was in, a, in a warehouse that burned. And uh, so this huge inventory of 28 different glasses in large chunks was, was lost. They tore the facility out and all the, measure, all the equipment and, and what have you, and buried it out in the, in the back of the plant. Wow. So no one would ever, ever see what we did. Oh, interesting.
But uh, that was the end of it. But in that process was this high quality and small quantities, and nobody record. It was never, never publicized. There were a number of instances down the years where, given a challenge, this is what we need. They produced a device that would that satisfied that. And it's been 40 years now with no new products. We can't live that. No. We need another one. <laughs>